Welcome to the 14th chapter on hybrid systems and games and the logical foundations of cyberphysical systems textbook, which is opening up an entirely new part of this textbook, where we're now studying adversarial cyberphysical systems. We will look at hybrid games that combine discrete continuous and adversarial dynamics. Hybrid systems have served as well throughout the entire textbook so far with their combination of discrete and continuous dynamics. But the point is that other cyberphysical systems require us to understand additional dynamical effects. Adversarial dynamics, for example, is relevant whenever there's choices in the system that can be resolved by different players. And that happens very frequently whenever you have CPSs with multiple agents that may or may not agree on a common goal. Or, even if they do agree on a common goal, they might still act differently based on a different perception of the world. This chapter now starts the far-reaching consequences of this insight and advances our understanding of hybrid programs to a programming language for hybrid games. The point is that hybrid systems and cyberphysical systems despite everything we ever pretended throughout the entire previous chapters of this textbook, are not actually the same. For example, some biological systems can be perfectly well understood as hybrid systems because, well, for example, they combine discrete activation of genes with a continuous biochemical reaction. But it's not because they're cyberphysical. They don't bring their own computer and communication devices. But they still feature hybrid systems' behavior. Physical processes can be understood as hybrid whenever things happen at very different speeds. Just remember the bouncing ball. An understanding of it separated out the fast, discrete change that happens when it's actually really deforming on the ground to bounce back up, compared to the slow, continuous dynamical systems aspect of flying through the air. Literally, when zooming in, we find out that both of those are actually continuous processes, but our understanding of it is much better if we benefit from the hybrid systems principle and understand every part on its most immediately natural level. The, the point of this chapter is that while not all hybrid systems are cyberphysical systems, the converse isn't true either. Not all cyberphysical systems are actually hybrid systems. And it's not because they lack discrete or continuous dynamics. No, it's because they feature additional dynamical aspects, which is indeed why CPSs are best understood as what I call multidynamical systems, the systems that feature multiple dynamical features, um, discrete dynamics, continuous dynamics, adversarial dynamics, stochastic dynamics, and so on. In a certain sense, Applications often have a plus one effect on dynamical aspects. You might start focusing on some number of dynamical features in the system and then during its analysis discover, oops, there's one more than you thought. Just again, think back of the bouncing ball. You know, the preliminary analysis might conclude that the bouncing balls are perfectly continuous systems. But then, whenever we're analyzing it, we all of a sudden understood that the deformation and bouncing back from the ground is just something quite characteristically different than the flying through the air. So we discovered that there is a discrete phenomenon that we didn't see initially. So in other words, whenever you are analyzing a system, be prepared to find one more dynamical aspect just around the corner. And that's yet another reason why it is useful to have a flexible and general analysis technique ground in the logic that still works even after you have discovered a new dynamical systems aspect. Now, having said all that, today's chapter will not enable us to understand literally all dynamical systems aspects at once. No, no, but we will take a look into the very important fundamental dynamical aspect of at the serial dynamics, which happens whenever multiple players in the context of a CPS, for example, interact on a hybrid system, and that then make their own respective choices in an arbitrary way. It's just in pursuit of their own goals and not in pursuit of others' um, goals. And we'll see that that can actually happen in different ways 
both active competition and analytic competition, well, we get there. What we're learning today in the modeling and control side is that we are understanding a new and important dynamical aspect of adversarial dynamics. This aspect is very important for understanding multiple agents with possibly conflicting ad actions in the system. And it also is important for us to understand when the adversarial dynamics is front and center in the system and when it can be neglected without loss of the analysis results. Adversarial dynamics for example, is very interesting in mixed cases. Remember, in differential learning logic, um, there were choices, and in a box context, we looked at all the choices. In a diamond context, we looked at just one of the choice, but there was no good way of talking about things in between, where some of the choices come out in your favor and others are turn out against you. Here, in this chapter, by looking at angelic and demonic choices, we can directly represent both of those. In this chapter, we look a lot at computational thinking principles in fundamental ways by developing logical extensions of the syntax, semantics, and axiomatics in differential learning logic that we have considered so far. And we're alluding to important programming language modularity principles by making sure that we add well, in fact, just only one duality operator to incorporate the adversariality aspects in a very modular way. This leads us to enable compositional extensions, where basically just by adding one thing at a time, we are able to understand the overall dynamics of the systems very well. We will be looking at what's called differential game logic, so a logic that uh, is for the study of um, hybrid games. Computer science, remember, it's ultimately about not just writing something, but doing an analysis of it, for example. A worst case analysis, an expected case analysis, or a correctness analysis. Now, in games land, all of a sudden, you can do more fine-grained levels in between the worst case analysis and the best case analysis, because, well, you can say and analyze what happens if some of the things are in your favor, so best case, wherever things are not in your favor, so worst case. And that's, of course, important whenever some, but not all, choices in the system go to an opponent, and the ones that don't go to the opponent are resolved in a way that is helping you. Which also is a way for understanding models of alternating computation, which are interesting in their own right. On the CPS skill side, we'll look at, you know, the multi-agents aspects of state change. We will have reason to generalize the semantics of cyber-physical systems quite considerably to take into account adversarial dynamics, which will enable us to also understand their effect better and will also lead us down a path of reflecting on the choices that have been even in hybrid systems so far. Let's successfully motivate the notion of a hybrid game. So basically what we've seen so far is things like my favorite robot that's moving in an environment where uh, we've seen the discrete dynamics and the continuous dynamics coming up very naturally. The discrete dynamics coming, for example, from the control decisions, like when a robot would like to um, you know, break because he spotted an obstacle or accelerate it because he's come clear of the obstacle other things like velocities and positions change more naturally understood as continuous dynamical systems principles. And we had a lot of fun with understanding these hybrid systems that result from that. Um, for example, also when there's decisions such as the turning and the angle of velocity going left and right or, or remaining uh, straight on, whereas the direction that the robot is moving into is best understood as a continuous quantity in response to the angle of velocity. But what happens if there's another robot, if our robot f finds another robot, um, then no matter how safe the analysis of this robot was, um, 
our robot could be very surprised by the actions that another robot does whenever the two of them come into conflict. Well, what they then find themselves in is a bit of a game. This robot has some goals and that robot has some goals and the way they resolve their actions could come into conflict at some of the parts of the state space, for example, at this intersection here. So it will become important for both of them to understand that not everything around them is resolving in their favor. Some of their things around them are not resolving in their favor, but at least their own control decisions are still resolved in their favor because they're under their own control. Now, that leads to the study of games, which of course have a long and successful history in mathematics and computer science as well. For example, you can look at extensive normal form games, matrix normal form games. Um, for example, the question whether it went on the foreign planet, would you rather like to gather trash or, or collect plants and, and then have certain payoffs such as you know, <clears throat> if both gather trash, then one of the robots is very happy. Um, and otherwise, um, if both gather plants, then the other robot is very happy, but if they're not with one another, they're both extremely unhappy. And then, and then chess, right? You can look at chess games, for example. All of this is super exciting, but it doesn't actually quite suffice, because all of these notions are for playing games in which there is no continuous dynamic. So what happens if you have all three of them? Then you are worrying about hybrid games. So the games that have rules that you play where the evolution is a mix of discrete dynamics so coming from control decisions, continuous dynamics coming from the French equation, and adversarial dynamics coming from the phenomenon that you've got multiple players in the game that don't necessarily agree in their choices. For example, this robot simply might not know what the other robot is doing. And these hybrid game aspects with their adversarial dynamics come up in cyber-physical systems for many different reasons. Our robot, for example, simply may be uncertain about what the other robot's intentions are, certainly in the beginning when they haven't interacted yet. And under those circumstances, even if the two of them are not actually competing for one another and are actually we'll be finding out that they're quite compatible with one another. Still, in the beginning, it's not like our robot can know that. Also, for example, our robot's goal will be to remain collision-free and get over there. Even if the goal of the other robot also is to be collision-free, uh, the goal of the other robot will not necessarily be to make sure that our robot gets over there. The goal of the other robot might be to remain collision-free and go down there. And well, these two goals are mostly compatible, but they could come in conflict whenever their actions locally influence each other. And they might actually collide. So at that moment, if your robot is colliding, um, even if it didn't mean to, you will still be sending your robot back to the design table and say something's not right with it. There's another twist of hybrid games. If you are talking to a test engineer who is simulating under what circumstance your robot control design exhibits faulty behavior, then the test engineer is actually also playing a hybrid game with you. you know, if your robot wins and remains safe, that's a good indication that your design is fine, at least in the one scenarios that the test engineer looked at. But if the test engineer wins and shows you an unsafe trace, well, I would argue then you still win, because even if you lost this particular simulation, you still found out more and learned better what the corner case behavior of your robot is, so that you can fix the design before you release it. Of course, you should ultimately then, after having tested the system for some time, do an actual safety analysis. But all of these were circumstances where you um, looked at adversarial dynamics, the phenomenon that different choices are resolved for different players for, by different purposes, more for analytic reasons. They were not really in competition. But there are also scenarios where there's direct competition, such as, for example, in RoboCop soccer, where if robots are playing soccer with one another, then the two robot teams literally cannot agree in which direction the ball is supposed to roll. So they're actually an active competition 
with trying to get the ball into different directions. Also, perfect hybrid games example. Now, overall, this is one example of the phenomenon that we already started observing right from the get-go in the first lecture, that cyberphysical systems are actually characterized as multi-dynamical systems, so systems with multiple facets of dynamical systems. They do combine discrete dynamics with continuous dynamics quite often and therefore fall into the hybrid systems class, but there can be other dynamical features in the systems. We will be looking at the adversarial dynamics in this lecture, but just keep in mind there can be other ways of resolving uncertainty with other types of dynamics, for example, the stochastic dynamics or the non-deterministic dynamics we already saw, but also distributed systems dynamical aspects, for example. And we also saw that by understanding that cyberphysical systems are multi-dynamical systems that combine multiple simpler dynamical effects with one another, we have already and will continue to simplify their description as well. Remember, a combination of continuous differential equations and separate discrete behavior that we throw together in a programming language. And like that, will we now add in an adversarial dynamics and still leverage programming languages compositionality principles for their description. And remember also how we then exploited this for the analysis purposes by making the analysis of CPSs more tame, exploiting compositionality, not just in the description, but also in the analysis of the systems. By understanding, which is what logic is good at, that not just the meaning of a bigger thing is a simple function of the meaning of the pieces, but also the analysis of the bigger thing is a simple function of the analysis of the pieces. Just remember. The meaning of A and B is that A and B is true whenever A is true and separately B is true, but also a proof of A and B consists of a proof of A together with a proof of B. And we've done that for hybrid systems. A system that has a non dismissive choice between alpha and beta is safe whenever it's safe for all the alpha behaviors and independently is safe for all the beta behaviors. The semantics and the description as well as the analysis went hand-in-hand -hand compositionally. Let's make that exact same thing work for adversarial dynamics. In particular, all of these classes of systems have their own dynamic logic. In hybrid systems, that's the one we focused on so far in the textbook that leads us to differential dynamic logic, which we now understand very well. If we add in adversarial dynamical systems aspects into the discrete and continuous dynamical systems mix, then we look at differential game logic. We keep in mind if we had instead added stochastic dynamics, we would have gotten to stochastic differential dynamic logic. Or if we're looking at distributed systems dynamical aspects, which aren't even in this picture here because the multi dynamical systems principle is more general than even that picture, we look at what I call quantified differential dynamic logic, which is a logic for combining hybrid systems and distributed systems aspects into distributed hybrid systems aspects. Now, in this third part of the textbook, we will be studying differential game logic as a way of understanding the adversarial dynamics in hybrid games. Let's develop this again gradually, one step at a time. We've seen hybrid programs as a programming language and differential logic formulas where the fundamental pieces were assignments for discrete dynamics, logical formulas for testing conditions, differential equations limited to evolution domain constraints for the atomic principles for continuous dynamics, and non-deterministic choices between two hybrid programs, sequential composition, first running alpha, then beta, and non-deterministic repetition, running alpha a number of times. And what were the logical operators around it? In addition to real arithmetic and quantifiers universally and existentially over the reals, we looked at the alpha box modality that for any hybrid program alpha and any differential any logic formula P says all runs of alpha lead to states in which P is true, and the alternative uh, alpha diamond P said that there is a way of running the hybrid program alpha to a state where P is true. Okay, that actually involved quite a bit of choices already. Where were they? The non-determinisms in the hybrid program run 
certainly came in from the non-deterministic choice. That much is clear is already in the name. Are there other non-deterministic choices in the execution of the systems? Well, not in the sequential composition, but in the differential equation, namely the duration that we follow the differential equation, and in the non-deterministic repetition. But the question is, how often do we run the alpha loop? All of those three circumstances, which are the only choices in the system, is the choice resolved non-deterministically. That means there is no prior commitment as to how they are resolved, but they will be resolved in all possible ways whenever you talk box modality, because it says all runs of alpha take us to states where p is true whereas they're resolved in one possible way whenever we're in the diamond modality context, because alpha diamond p says there's one way of running alpha to a state where p is true. So that's looking at all choices, and that's looking at one choice. And the point is that all of the choices are resolved in one way, in, in every possible way, or in just one possible way. And the mode is whether all the non deterministic choices hurt or help is just decided by the modality that's around it. And so, but how can you say that you know some of the choices are resolved in your favor while others are not? You find a way of doing that in hybrid programs and differential limit logic? Well, in hybrid programs, we can't, right? They just say there's choices, and well, they're resolved non deterministically. Maybe in differential limit logic, we can. Where do choices get resolved? Here universally and here existentially. We could combine them. All right, we could, for example, say for all alpha 1 behavior, there is an alpha 2 behavior, such that for all alpha 3 behavior, there is an alpha 4 behavior, such that p is then true. Nice interaction. Always one way, always one way. But no matter how big the formula is that we write down because of that, this is inherently limited to finitely many of these alternations of behaviors. So for a fixed interaction depth, we can get away with just using differential limit logic. But for an unbounded number of them, not anymore. Besides, uh, it's not necessarily super practical to do it like that, because imagine all, every behavior of the car in front of you, and then there's one behavior of your follower car, such that every behavior of the car in front of you, there's one. That would be a whole lot of reasoning about pretty similar car dynamics everywhere. That doesn't exactly scale very well. So let's develop something that is more, more powerful for these purposes. And well, what do we basically need? We have operators for one player already. Hey, the player didn't get a name. Let's call her Angel. And then Angel has a choice operator, Angel has a repetition operator, Angel has differential equations that she can follow for a duration that she likes, and we can challenge Angel by asking that now she has to pass a test Q, a logical formula, whether it's true. The, the program stops whenever Q isn't true and the run is discarded. Well, that was a whole bunch of choices for the Angel player. What can we do to enable choices for another player. Of course, the eternal opponent of the angel player has to be called the demon player, and we could give the demon player choices operators. For example, demonic choice, so demon now gets to choose between the two programs. Demonic repetition, so demon now gets to decide how often he wants to repeat this. Uh, demon's differential equation, so it's the differential equation x prime equals f of x, but demon is in charge of deciding how long he wants to do that, and actually also demon's challenge. This is now a formula Q that demon needs to pass as a test, otherwise he'll have lost the game. We can do that. We could be adding all of these operators, but oh boy, that would be a whole lot of change of the language. And you know, each of them would have to have their semantics, and each of them would have to have their reasoning principles, and they all need to be interacting in interesting ways. It's easier to instead just add one operator, the duality operator, that passes control between the players. So by the duality operator, Whatever used to be Angel's choice becomes Demon's choice, and whatever used to be Demon's choice becomes Angel's choice. 
you should understand the duality operator like what happens when you have a chessboard and when you're no longer playing from the perspective of the white player duality flips the chessboard around by 180 degrees such that all the choices you used to have are now what the opponent can make and all of the choices that the opponents used to have are the ones that you can now make. But of course also the tests will have been flipped so whatever the the player for white would have to make true during the game now the opponent will have to make true and whatever the um, player for black would have to make true during the game now you have to make true for the game. What happens if we use duality on a game that has already been dualized? Well, then we flip the chessboard again around by 180 degrees. Think of it like playing the game from the other player's perspective. Everything flips around. Every choice you used to have, now the opponent gets to make. And every choice that the opponent used to be able to make, now you get to make. That's what the duality operator does. And once we've got the duality operator, we can actually think about the question what happens with other operators that we could be adding in. For example, our familiar if-then-else operation. How can we define if logical formula Q is true, then alpha, alpha, and beta? Let's think about it. Well, on the outset, um, there's a choice, right? There's, there's a choice because there's a branching behavior of different behaviors, either alpha or beta. But of course, the choice now at the moment is Angel's choice. And so she would have to say whether she wants to run Alpha or Beta, but she's not supposed to, right? She's, she's only supposed to run the left-hand side, Alpha, if Q was indeed true. And she's only allowed to run the right-hand side, Beta, if Q was indeed not true. So, of course, that means we can challenge her on the left-hand side to make sure that Q is true. Because if she were to try to run the left choice and Q is not true, then she would fail her challenge and will have lost the game right away. She, of course, doesn't want to do that. So she will only run the left choice if Q is indeed true. As written, it would still be possible to run the right choice beta under all circumstances, and that would give a lot of power to Angel. Fine, but we're not be representing the if and else operator correctly, unless we also add in a test challenge on the right hand side where we say well if angel is running the right hand side then she first will have to pass the challenge that not q is true and only then is it okay for her to run beta you can think about how you can write down if then else also if you were to use demon's choice instead let's turn this into text by optical character recognition how can we describe a while q do alpha program in a game. Well, on the outset, of course, that will somehow repeatedly run alpha. And OK, we can make it Angel's choice to, to repeat alpha. But now it's completely under arbitrary choice by Angel that she can run this as often as she wants. She, she should actually only be repeating this if she passes the challenge where Q is true, because you know otherwise she shouldn't have been repeating a while loop. Now Angel can still decide arbitrarily that she stops the repetition earlier. But the while loop, of course, is supposed to be only stopped when the logical condition in the loop guard is actually false. So that means we now challenge Angel to make sure that when she stops the loop, not Q is true, so Q is false. Okay, think about how you could do that out of demons. Control optical character recognition recognizes this again. Well, we have now defined um, other operators and games, but the real question was actually not how we define the ones we already know how to define in hybrid systems and convince ourselves yet again that they're still fine in hybrid games. The real question is, what about the new game operators that Demon has? Do we find a way of defining out of easier operators the fact that Demon has a choice between running the hybrid game alpha or running the hybrid game beta. That operator alone won't work because that would describe Angel's choice, right? So here, that's a very bad idea because this side gives the choice of whether to play alpha or the beta game to the Angel player. 
And over here, we're also playing Alpha or Beta, but a completely different player gets to make the call on which side to play it, namely Demon. Well, but we can make this a dual game, right? Now it's a dual game of the choice between Alpha and Beta. Well, the choice used to be Angel's choice, but because it's dualized, we flip the chessboard around by 180 degrees, so whatever used to be Angel's choice now becomes Demon's choice. So that's sort of expressing this. But the problem is, of course, that we have also flipped everything within Alpha because it's dualizing all the actions in the entire thing, including Alpha and including Beta. We correctly assigned this to Demon, but that, unfortunately, is all flipped. What can we do? Yes, indeed. What we can do is turn the chessboard around again by dualizing and turn the chessboard around again by dualizing. So the idea is whatever game we have used to be this way, if we turn it around, um, then the choice that Angel used to have is dualized to demons, but since we turn it around again, the game is facing the ordinary direction as it used to be before. In other words, demon's choice between Alpha and Beta is nothing but the double dual choice of Angel's choice. So we turn the chessboard around, Angel makes the call, but because we turned it around it's really demon, and then we quickly turn it back to make sure we were back in the original game Alpha. In fact, dualizing a dual game will have no effect but to return back to the original game we had. Now, having understood this, how can we define demon's repetition? So it's a repetition, it's like a repetition, except the demon gets to say how often he wants to repeat. How can we define that? Well, it's got to be something repetition, only now it's the wrong player making the choice. So if we were to say alpha star, you know, we would have said that the way demon gets to make a repetition is to ask angel what she wants, and maybe that's quite right, but that doesn't exactly describe demon's repetition principles. So instead, we'll have to dualize that. Uh, now the choice that used to be angel's choice and repetition belongs to demon because it's in a dualized context, but unfortunately everything when in alpha will also have been flipped to the wrong player. So if we dualize that again, right, then we're back to ordinary operation. In other words, demon's repetition also is the double dual of angel's repetition. How do we represent the dual differential equation, the one where demon gets to make the choice? Well, precisely by writing down the duality operator on the differential equation. But is it now making a difference whether we wrote down the dual of a differential equation? or the differential equation themselves. That's the same ODE, right? It's the same evolution domain constraint. Well, but, and here's the point, even if we're following the same ODE on both of those sides, it's still a different player who gets to say how long. Here, it's an ordinary differential equation in which Angel gets to decide how long she wants to do this. And here it's in a dual context, so what used to be Angel's choice does become Demon's choice. So it's Demon who says how long he wants to follow the differential equation. That can make quite a difference, of course. Likewise, here is also Angel's responsibility to make sure that Q is still true at all the time. And in fact, she will lose if it's not in the beginning right away. On the other side, here it's Demon's choice. So in other words, these two are very different operations, a differential equation and a dual differential equation. Don't ever confuse them. I guess I like that for assignments, right? This is a dual assignment and this is an ordinary assignment. So here Angel gets to make the assignment and here Demon gets to make the assignment. Well, uh, hold on a second. Does it actually make a difference who makes the assignment? It's still the same assignment, right? We're still assigning the value that the term e has at the moment to the variable x and then move on. It's not like any player had any choices but what to do at all. So in other words, for assignments, the duality operator doesn't actually have an effect. Well, what about tests? The challenge operators? Testing whether a logical formula q is true? Are they the same or are they different? Well, they're testing the same logical condition but 
a different player will lose. Here it's Angel's test, so it's she will lose the game immediately unless Q is true at the moment. And here it's in a dual context, so even if there wasn't a choice, there's still the responsibility. So Demon will lose the game immediately if Q wasn't actually true. Also, in other words, for the test, just like actually for the differential equation, the duality makes a big difference for the effect of what happens when a test fails. Here, Angel loses prematurely, and here, Demon loses prematurely. Good. In other words, the takeaway message is that if only we have a duality operator, all of these choices and repetitions and ODEs and challenges for Demon are all already definable out of the ones we gave to Angel. So let's properly develop the syntax of differential game logic, starting with the syntax of hybrid games we just looked into. Here is the hybrid games language. It looks very familiar to the hybrid programs language that we already had. Most of the operators are actually the same. We need still a discrete assignment that changes state in an instant of time by assigning the value of the term e to the variable x. We still need a test or challenge game that will check whether the logical formula q is true at the moment. And if it is, that's great. If it isn't, the angel player lost prematurely by violating the rules of the game. This is how we can express rules of the game. Differential equations are like in hybrid programs. But now the angel player is in charge to decide how long she wants to follow the differential equation x prime equals f of x. Of course, she will still have to make sure that she always stays inside the evolution domain constraint q, a logical formula that she can't leave at any moment during the continuous evolution along the different equation. In particular, she'll also have to make sure that q is true in the beginning, otherwise not even the solution of duration zero will satisfy x prime equals f of x and q. There's the game of choice. It's a choice between playing the game alpha and playing the game beta. Think of it like a choice between playing Monopoly or Scrabble. An angel gets to make the choice. Or think of it as a choice between playing the robot gets to accelerate or a robot gets to slow down game. Or a choice between having the robot leave the building by using the door or having the robot leave the building by crashing through the wall. Maybe that's a very bad idea, but, but you get the idea, regardless of what the choice game is. And in, of course, every time you play a game of choice, uh, Angel gets to make her choice without being influenced by anybody else. Sequential game. First, you run the game alpha, and when you're done with that, you run the game beta. Think of it like first running the Monopoly game and then running the Scrabble game. Or think of it like first running the game where you need to get your robot to a charging station, and then whenever you're charged up, run the game of getting your robot to the goal. For example, when you're running a racetrack, it's very important to do fuel recharges or electricity recharges in a bit of a clever way. Here's the repetition game. Run the game alpha star by repeating alpha any number of times. And it's Angel's call how, how long she wants to do that. So here, here, and here, everything is Angel's decision. The game of repetition in particular will enable Angel to decide whether she wants to repeat alpha at all. Whenever she decided to repeat alpha one more round, she gets to inspect the state at the end and decide whether she wants to do that again. If she likes the state, she'll stop. If she doesn't like it, she, she can go again. Is there a subtlety? What should Angel not do? I guess she really shouldn't be saying that she wants to go again and go again and go again and go again and go again, and go again literally all the time. Even if my son would like to do that when playing games, that's not actually acceptable because you never get to bed. Well, the other thing is you never stop for evaluating any condition on who won the game. So she can decide to repeat as often as she wants, but um, she can't do this forever. Just like in a differential equation, actually, right? Angel can also decide how long she wants to follow a differential equation, but it's a real number. It's not infinity. Because again, after an infinite duration, well, there is no afterwards. Now, all of these were, uh, you know, hybrid games that we basically are reading a bit differently than the hybrid systems reading that we had so far, but 
you know, all the choices were literally angels. And that's something that demon will only accept for some amount of time. Uh, because after, you know, having played a bunch of games, he'll probably notice that he never had anything to decide. And then he doesn't want to play anymore. So demon comes in by the duality operator, by the dual game, when we say we're playing the hybrid game alpha, but now the dual version of that, where all the choices that Angel used to have are demon's choices, and all the choices that demon used to have are angel's choices. How can demon have had choices with an alpha? Well, he can if alpha doesn't mention duality operators, but alpha, of course, could very well still recursively mention our duality operators. So whenever you hit a duality operator, the chessboard is flipped around by 180 degrees. So every choice that angel had goes to demon, and every choice that demon had goes to angel. And in fact, also for the challenges, whenever you're losing the game prematurely because you failed a challenge test or you uh, failed to satisfy the evolution domain constraint, then that player whose responsibility that was is losing prematurely right away. This is where Angel is losing, but in a dual context it is instead where Demon is losing prematurely. Let's write down some games. For example, here's the push around cart game, where you have a cart at a position x, which is moving with current velocity v, and Angel is pulling or holding back on one side, and Demon is pulling or, or, or pushing on the other side. How can we describe this as a hybrid game? Well, certainly the position will be changing with velocity v. That's the different equation we already understand. x prime equals v. Let's just write that down right away, x prime equals v. Um, how is the velocity changing? Well, the velocity is changing depending on how much Angel is pulling and how much Demon is pulling or pushing. So overall, the velocity is changing as a sum of Angel's and Demon's acceleration choice. If I just orient them in the right way to make sure that positive always goes this way, just to make it easier for us. And what are the choices that the two players have? Well, let's just say Angel can push by choosing acceleration plus one or pull by choosing acceleration minus one, and so can Demon by choosing acceleration plus one or choosing acceleration minus one. They have their various choices. So let's write those choices down. Angel first chooses between, you know, pauses for negative acceleration, then in a dual context, a really what used to be Angel's choice becomes Demon's choice. Demon is choosing between a positive or a negative acceleration. And then we follow the differential equation where the position is changing with velocity and the velocity is changing with the sum of the accelerations A plus D. And then we can repeat this by Angel's choice. So she gets to play this game over and over and over again as often as she would likes. This of course, is one order where first Angel chooses and then Demon chooses. Instead, we could have written down the game where first Demon chooses his choice and then Angel chooses her choice. And then we follow the differential equation with the mixed effect, the sum of all the effects of the variables in this particular case. Does that make a difference? Also, here we have a dual choice, and here we have a dual choice. We could have directly written down the fact that this is demon's choice under both of those circumstances using demon's choice operator. Is that exactly the same as that? Well, not quite. If you remember what demon's choice operator meant, it's the double dual of angel's choice. So that would give us a dual and then inside it yet another dual. Still the same. Why? Well, because in this particular case, the subprogram only is an assignment, and for assignments, we already said it doesn't matter whether we apply a duality operator to it or not. So we could also have written it using the definable operator, or first using angel's choice, then demon's choice, or first using demon's choice and then angel's choice. Notice 
neither of these could we ever have said with a hybrid system. Why? Well, because with a hybrid system, we can, for example, say first there's a choice between positive acceleration and negative acceleration, and then there's another choice between positive acceleration and negative acceleration, and then the two of them act. But but the choices now, I mean, then they're just resolved non-deterministically. There's nothing with players. Now, for example, in a box modality context, we will look at all ways how both of those choices resolve. In the diamond modality context, we would look at just one way how they resolve, but there's no way of saying in the hybrid systems that you know these are different choices being resolved by different players as we are doing here. It's the alternation of choices that makes games very interesting. Well, okay, good, cool, fine. These are all games, and that's a whole lot of fun to write down hybrid games, but we're not asking questions about them yet. What is the question we should be asking? Well, maybe for this game, we should be asking questions like, um, will it always be the case the position is greater than zero? But that's maybe more of a stupid question, because will it always be the case that very much will depend on how the players resolve their choices? So in hybrid systems, that makes some sense to ask, is it always true for every run that something, something, something happy post condition is true? Or is it true under after one run that a happy post condition is true? But but in these games, that's some of the wrong question, right? Because you're not really asking whether every way a game can be played makes you win. That's a bit much to ask for. But usually you're asking, do I have a way of playing such that no matter what strategy the opponent is following, I'll win regardless. And indeed, these are the logical formulas that we would really like to be using here. We would like to ask this hybrid game, does the angel player have a winning strategy to make some winning condition to it? Just make sure the position is positive. Or the demon player could have a winning strategy in this game and ask himself, can he make sure that the position is negative? Let's develop such a logic. We've seen the hybrid game language, and now we're adding the differential game logic formula language. Most of the operators um, we've already seen, the hybrid games we've seen, most of them are just sort of like an hybrid program, except we're reading them a bit differently as angel chooses ODE duration, angel chooses choice left, right, and, and angel chooses to repeat as often as she wants. But the important thing is exactly this duality operator, the thing that makes the chessboard flip around by 180 degrees. So look at the game from a different perspective, give different players the choices. Um, most of the differential game logic is also like differential dynamic logic was. In fact, it was technically sort of the same. Um, real arithmetic, not and quantifiers, they're still over the reals because that makes the most sense in Sabbatical Systems land. But what's with the modalities? Well, as we just talked about, right, the hybrid systems reading of modalities doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That would be is there one way of playing the game, or for all ways of playing the game, something, something, something. But that's not doing justice to the interactivity that is natural and inherent in gameplay. Instead, what we can ask is alpha diamond P is a formula that's true whenever Angel wins the alpha game to a state where P is true, or rather, let's be more precise, winning, you know, not just because she was lucky right, this time around, because her opponent demon hasn't been paying attention, but rather, alpha diamond P now means that Angel has a winning strategy to win in the hybrid game form. Alpha is describing basically the rules of the game, and to win into a state where the objective P is true, meaning a state where the logical formula P is true, which will be what she's trying to achieve in playing the hybrid game alpha. And the logical formula alpha diamond P is true whenever Angel does indeed have a winning strategy to resolve her choices in a helpful way, such that no matter what strategy the opponent's choosing, no matter what he's doing to resolve the demon's choices, still P is true. 
that formula then is expressing that demon has a winning strategy in the hybrid game alpha to get to one of the states in which the logical formula p is true. So his objective will be to make p true just like her objective was to make p true. Angel wants to get to a state while well, resolving the choices that happen to be in hers within alpha and working for every way that demon could have to resolve the choices that are his within alpha to get to a state where p is true. Whereas here, sort of the opposite. Um, all the choices within alpha is what demon is trying to resolve if they're his in a way that's helping him to get to a state where p is true, whereas angel is resolving all the states that are hers. Could be resolving them against demon's interest. Let's just think for a second. What would happen if we hadn't had any duality operators at all in the alpha? What does alpha diamond alpha box mean then? Well, then all the choices go to angel, right? The duration of the ODE, the choice of the game of choice the question I often repeat, but also all the blame goes to her. If she's failing a test, she lost prematurely. Demon just sits by as a passive observer, but doesn't do anything. In that case, Alpha Diamond P gives Angel full control over what's happening when the game Alpha is playing. So, except for the fact that Demon's going to be hardly bored, this is essentially asking the question whether there is one way of running the game alpha to a state where P is true, which is precisely what it used to be in the hybrid systems case. Likewise, if demon duality operators never occur, then alpha box P, well, all the choices within alpha are of angels choosing, and she isn't helping demon, right? So if we ask him, does Demon have a winning strategy, he will have to make sure, you know, all ways of running that game that he never gets to decide anything in will resolve in states where P holds true. In other words, single-player hybrid games are actually just the same as a hybrid system. That's how differential game logic is a natural extension of differential dynamic logic. But of course, these single-player hybrid games aren't super exciting. The more exciting uses of differential game logic are when actually duality operators occur, such that there is interaction of different choices by the different players, because otherwise Demon will really go home at some point and not want to play with Angel anymore. By the way, the mnemonic I have for remembering which of those modalities was which is that just like Angel, the modality operator for Angel has wings, right? But really the names are completely arbitrary. It doesn't matter that I call them Angel and Demon. I've used completely other names for the players, but I can't remember what player one and player two so well, so I find Angel and Demon more, more entertaining for our purposes. Let's look at some simple examples of games. Here's now a game that asks whether Angel has a winning strategy because of the diamond modality to make it to a state where the value of x is between 0 and 1. 1 exclusive, but never mind. So the game starts with a repetition that is under Angel's control, so she can repeat this as often as she wants. And every time she has a choice to run the left side or the right side, if she runs the left side, then the value of x is increased by 1. And because of duality, control is given so the opponent who gets to decide on the duration of a differential equation, x prime equals 1, which will increase the value of x. Or if Angel chooses to play the right sub game, then the value of x is decreased. She can do this any number of times. And the question is, does Angel indeed have a winning strategy in this hybrid game to make it to a state where the value of x is between 0 and 1? Think about how you would play it. For example, when you start with the value 10, well, Angel would probably want to repeat, otherwise she would have lost. Then she would probably want to play the right step game, which decreases the value of x from 10 to 9. She would want to do that again to 8, and so on, and so on, 7, 6, until the value of x is 0, and then she will probably want to stop, because she will have won the game. If instead 
we start at the value minus 2, then Angel would want to repeat, because if she stopped, she would have lost the game. Um, now she would probably not want to play the right sub game, because that decreases the value of x. Instead, she would play the left sub game, where the value of x is increased to minus 1. But then Demon takes control of the different equation, and it can follow it for how long should he be following it? Well, how about for a long time, until the value of x is a million? What would Angel want to do then? She would definitely want to have to repeat and can play the right sub-game to decrease the value to 999,999. She could do that again and again and again and again and again until the value of x is zero. Now, of course, that is an argument now why in one way of playing the game she won. And you can already see why Demon wouldn't have had better choices, certainly not in the gameplay where he wasn't ever asked because the value of x was already positive. But the question whether this formula is valid is the formula where it is true in all states, whether it is indeed true in all the states of values that x could have. That Angel does have a winning strategy, which, for example, we concretely write down to make sure we convince ourselves that the formula is true. What would happen if we change the ODE to be x prime equals x square? Well, in that case, when we're asking ourselves whether there is such a winning strategy, if x is negative, which remember is the only trouble point, because otherwise you just keep on decreasing it, if x is negative, then you can follow x prime equals x square for some arbitrary duration. Um, but, you know, whatever value it has at the end, still, if it's Bigger than 1, you play this side until it is between 0 and 1. And if it's less than, you just keep on playing this side, and every time the value of x will be increased. So ultimately, it's going to have to be in this, in this, in, in, in some part of the range where you can play this again. Now, if you move to another example where um, on the right subgame, Demon still has a choice whether he would like to decrease the value by 1 or by 2. Then the question is again, if we have the ordinary x prime equals 1 different equation, does Angel have a winning strategy to make sure that her value is always between 0 and 1? What could possibly go wrong? Well, what could now go wrong is, for example, you start at the value minus 4, Angel would love to repeat. She will want to increase the value at least by 1, so to minus 3, and then Demon gets asked how long he wants to follow the ODE x prime equals 1. Say to the value 10. Now Angel will want to play the right-hand side, but every time Demon gets asked whether he will actually decrease the value by 1 or by 2. Suppose he will say decrease by 2, so from 10 you go down to 8, again uh, 6, again 4, again 2, again. Demon can now play 1, so the value is 1, which isn't quite a winning state just yet, and so Angel will have to do this again, and will again want to decrease, but now Demon decides on decreasing it by 2, so the value is minus 1. That's bad. Um, Angel will want to repeat this, and then now she wants to play the left-hand side, and if she repeats it, she, she will increase the value from minus 1 to 0, but then Demon gets asked and can increase the value again to 10, for example. So we're back to where we started. So we can keep on playing this game forever, but in any case, Angel doesn't actually have a winning strategy to make sure she'll ultimately get to a state where she will have won, because Demon can always, always fool her, and that means she does not have a winning strategy, and that means this formula is not valid. You have to think about which states the formula is still true. What now happens if you take the same example, but again modify the differential equation to x squared? Well, in that case, Angel can play this game repeatedly. Um, we've just already seen that because Demon gets to choose whether the value is decreased by 1 or by 2, he can make the value negative if he wants to. If the value is negative, however, something interesting happens. If, for example, the value is minus 2, it will be increased. But now Demon is following the differential equation x prime equals x squared. And so 
the square of a negative number is a positive number except when it's the square of zero, which means as the value of x hits zero, x prime equals x squared can no longer make any progress. So it will be stopped at the value zero. And you should think about whether you've actually won the game or not. But let's move to more interesting games. Let's revisit the pusher on card game, where demon and angel are pulling and pushing on the card that's moving in position x with velocity v. And now we can ask, if the velocity is greater than 1 in the beginning, then is it true that Demon has a winning strategy where he gets to move first and then Angel gets to make her control choice to make sure the velocity is greater than 0 all the time? It's Angel's choice, right? Now, what could Demon do? He could, well, he, he, he will have to commit first, right, before he knows what Angel does. So that's an unfortunate situation to be in. But what can he do to make sure that the velocity is greater than 0 in any case? You can just put a positive value in 1, because even if Angel then plays the value minus 1, they will still add up to 0 or more, which makes in any case true that if the velocity was at least 1 in the beginning, of course it'll stay above 0 all the time. Now, of course, remember that even if I have used an explicit duality operator here, we could have written down Demon's choice. Now, what if instead the question is, what if position and velocity are greater than zero? Again, for the same reason, a demon can simply conservatively put the acceleration value 1 in, and then it doesn't matter which choice angel will do, the velocity value will be at least zero, which means, since that's how the position is changing, that both the velocity and the position were at least zero, and so the position will, of course, also stay at least zero. Playing this choice, demon can compensate for whatever angel can be doing with a. Well, now let's make it a bit more interesting. Let's delete the assumption whether the velocity is greater than zero, and then of course, um, well, uh, since angel controls the repetition, demon would have no way of generally winning because, well, maybe she even starts in a state where the velocity is very negative, and then you know position could be very negative at some point as well. But what if instead we ask whether Angel has a winning strategy when we start at position greater than zero to get to a position greater than zero? Does she? Yeah, but for boring reasons, she can simply skip the loop. It's her choice. If we start there, of course, you know, we're going to end up at a position greater than zero if she decides to stop the loop right away. Okay, that was, in other words, a valid formula, but also a very boring one. What if we delete that assumption? What if without any assumptions we simply ask, is it possible in this push around card game, does Angel have a winning strategy to get to a state where x is greater than zero? No, she does not, because Demon can play the counter strategy even if he doesn't know what Angel is playing, to always play minus 1 for his value, so that even if Angel is adding 1 to that, V prime will still be 0 all the time, which means unless the position has already been above 0 in the beginning, it will never actually be greater than 0. So there's a counter strategy. This formula is not valid. Now what if instead we give Angel a bit more force? So now we've got a strong Angel with 2 or minus 2 for her values. Does she then have a strategy that will make her win to a non-negative position all the time? Now she does. She's stronger. Right? Even if Demon is you know, trying to play minus 1, she can play 2, which overall will make sure that V prime is at least 1. And if V prime is at least 1, if you just wait long enough, ultimately the value of x is going to be greater than 0. So that formula is valid. What if both of them are strong? A demon is strong and angel are strong. And then we follow for a certain time, at most one time unit, this differential equation. Is, is it true that angel has a winning strategy to make sure that x squared is ultimately greater or equal to 100? Does she have a winning strategy for that? Well, could happen. Demon 
we'll be choosing a positive or a negative value. What would Angel have to do to make use of that? She could play the opposite of that. That wouldn't be very good because then we end up at v prime equals zero, and so unless x squared is already greater than 100 in the beginning, that will never get her closer to the goal. What else can she do? Demon will have to play one of the two. If Angel then copies this, she will play the same value. Then, since it's her differential equation, she can follow the ODE for example for up to one time unit, which will have made the velocity either positive or negative. One of the two, we don't know, because it depends on what demon has been playing. But then, what she can do next time is whatever demon is playing, she will simply play an acceleration that fits to the sign of, that the velocity has. So, in other words, demon could, the most that he could do is cancel her effects out, but that will still keep the velocity at least at zero, or better in the direction that she's trying to move into. And that means ultimately x will have moved far enough away from zero. In other words, ultimately x will be at least greater equal 10, or less or equal minus 10, and that of course will make the square greater equal 100. So that formula has a valid one. Let's look at another example of two robots performing a robot dance on an admittedly one-dimensional planet, where um, the Eve robot is at this position, moving with velocity f and with acceleration g, while the Wally robot is at that position, moving with velocity v and with acceleration u. Now the question is, if both of them are close together, so the distance is at most one, and they start with the same velocities, is it then true that now demon's repetition in angel's winning strategy are such that Angel has a winning strategy even if her opponent Demon is moving, that the positions are close to one another. Come on, it would be boring if we had given this repetition also to Angel, because if we start with close together and Angel gets to decide how long she wants to repeat, she could decide zero time, that's infinitely boring, but it would make the formula have a win trivial winning strategy. So it's only actually interesting if we give the repetition choice to the opponent. And then first, Wally, to make it a bit more harder, will choose its acceleration positive or negative, and then Angel will choose an acceleration as positive or negative. Oh, that actually isn't harder because she will at least know what Wally has done. So then we follow the differential equation where Wally's position is changing with his velocity, Wally's velocity is changing with his acceleration, Eve's position is changing with her velocity, her velocity is changing with her acceleration. We do the whole thing for at most one time unit in a dual differential equation. In other words, the time is determined by Demon, the angel's opponent, so she can't make this choose in a good way. Why is that again important? Because otherwise she could trivialize the whole question by always just following for zero time units. So that if you start close together, of course, you stay close together now often, no matter how often you repeat this. But then, of course, Angel can choose a copy strategy that says whenever Wally accelerated, she will do too. And whenever Wally decelerated, she will do too. That means They'll stay close together if they started close together. Notice what we've done here is actually something quite interesting. Um, really, even if at first it looked like a two-player game of Wally versus Eve doing a robot dance, you can also look at it as there's Wally and Eve and the world around them, which is supposed to control the passage of time. But when Eve plays Angel's part, controlling her choice, then she can conservatively assign the world's decisions in terms of how long to follow an ODE to her opponent Demon, who is controlling the world time, even if, even if as far as I know, Wally isn't exactly controlling the world time, because that will make sure she conservatively uh, wins, even if the world time is not exactly resolving in her favor. In other words, a game with more than two players can be reduced to a game with two players. Alternatively, 
we could have flipped the game around and asked for the demon player, uh, where Wally is de playing the demon, whether he can make sure that this is true, that if you start close together, you get far apart, which is the opposite of the question we ask right now, or the dual version of it. And um, now again, it is better to put the passage of time conservatively to the opposite player. So the, the, what used to be a dual differential equation is no more dual differential equation, because otherwise um, the question gets possibly too easy. Do another example. Playing robot soccer. Where there's a goalie robot and a robot that's trying to score a goal. How does that work? There's a ball that the robot can kick either with upwards velocity w and longitudinal velocity v or downwards with um, downwards velocity minus w and still longitudinal velocity v. That's a choice that this robot has in the beginning when the game is kicked off. But then repeatedly will the goalie robot have the choice to either move with upwards velocity here or with downwards velocity, and that's Angel's robot that she's controlling here, moving with constant velocity, u up or down, and she can possibly repeat this because, of course, once the ball is kicked off, you know, it can't change its mind anymore, it's rolling, but the goalie could still move up and down in arbitrary ways. So now the question is, when does the Angel player controlling the goalie robot have a winning strategy to make sure that when following this game, she can capture the ball, which we characterize as um, x squared plus the distance of y, y minus g squared being less or equal to 1. In other words, you're close enough to the ball. Say the radius 1 is the radius in which you happen to catch the ball. Well, does the goalie robot have a winning strategy that Angel can tell him? Well, not in general, right? If this velocity is very large and this velocity is very small, and they're very far apart, then there's always, a, even if you position the goalie right in one corner, the opponent could just position the goalie in the opposite corner. In fact, they're starting out at the same lateral position, just to make that a bit easier and symmetric, the argument. It isn't always true, under all circumstances, that there is a winning strategy for the goalie robot, but it is true under this assumption. If, so next time you play soccer, remember this, if x over v squared times u minus w squared is less or equal 1, then there is a winning strategy to make sure the goalie robot can always catch the ball. Let's next take a look at developing an operational game semantics. We'll actually do that only informally because the official semantics will develop next time. But it's still insightful to gain some operational intuition for how gameplay is unfolding. First thing to do is the assignment game, where if we're playing a game of assignment, um, all that is happening is that we go from the old state omega to a new state that has the only change, the value of the variable x changed, and what it has changed to is exactly the value that the right-hand side expression has in the old state omega. So no choices were actually necessary in assignments. For a differential equation, however, if you play that in a state omega, a whole lot of choices are possible. You always follow the solution of the differential equation within the evolution domain constraint, but there's a lot of choice going to Angel, namely how long does she want to do that? For zero time units, for t time units, for r time units, and it gives you uncountably infinite branching, usually, except when you're at a position where uh, the logical formula Q is not true, then there will be no choices and she will have lost the game right away because she was supposed to play the ODE and couldn't, or in the circumstances where the evolution domain constraint Q is still true, but isn't true right in the, in the, for any longer amount of time, and then the only duration that she can choose is zero. When playing the test, what you go to is exactly the same old mega state that you already started at, except that that transition is only possible when the formula Q is really true in the state of mega. Otherwise, you can't transition again, Angel loses the game right away. For a game of choice, playing that from a state of mega 
asks Angel to decide whether she wants to play the left sub game and then play whatever Alpha is doing, which could lead to multiple possible states. Again, interactively, because the demon player might still be asked while well, this game Alpha is unfolding. Or she gets to decide to play the right sub game and play these. Of course, once she said to play, for example, the left sub game, she can't in the middle of it say, oh, actually, that was a bad idea. I should have played the right sub game. It's her choice at that moment. But once chosen, she can't change her mind. The sequential game first plays however the game alpha unfolds, which it could do in multiple ways. And when done with that, we continue to play the beta sub game which of course could unfold in many different ways. The game of repetition, when you play that, asks Angel whether she wants to stop, in which case you st stop in the state that you were already in Omega, or she gets to decide to repeat. If she repeats, then the game Alpha unfolds, which it could do in multiple possible ways. When we're done with playing the game Alpha one round of the repetition game, then again, Angel gets to inspect the state that you're in, and she's asked, do you want to stop right now or do you want to repeat again? If she repeats again, the game repeats, one more round of alpha, which maybe could unfold this way. And again, she's asked, do you like it? Do you want to stop or do you want to go again? And stop and go again and stop and go again and stop and go again. Speaking of again, what's subtle about this again? Well, what's subtle about the semantics again is the point that the one thing that Angel shouldn't do forever is to say repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat all the time. Because then the game would never stop giving you an opportunity to inspect who actually won the post condition and the differential game logic from it. That's one of the reasons I will be moving to a different type of semantics officially, although it is still very useful to see this operational tree semantics in action. Dual game, if alpha plays where some of the choices are angels written as diamonds and other choices are demons written as boxes, then the alpha dual game will basically rotate all of them at 45 degrees. So what used to be angels' choice is now demons' choice, what used to be demons' choice is now angels' choice, and so on. But nothing else in the structure of the game changes, except of course that whenever somebody fails a test, the responsibility for that is also flipped to the other player. Because otherwise it wouldn't be very fair if one player gets to make the choices the other one did, but doesn't suffer the consequences if choosing the wrong choices. Let's use that for some intuition. For example, about the hybrid game that says, it's not very hybrid, but it says, does Angel have a winning strategy to make it to a state where X is zero? In the game where she gets to decide to repeat, and every time, Demon gets to decide whether he wants to play 0 or 1 into X. Well, when we ask ourselves, does Angel have a winning strategy in this game, then we will start with some initial value of X. Let's call it capital X. And yeah, well, there is the case where stopping is a great idea because it already has the value 0. But that's kind of a boring case. What exists, but more exciting is the other one to worry about. What if she has to repeat because the value of X isn't necessarily 0 yet? So if she repeats, well, then Demon is being asked whether he wants to play the 0 or the 1. If he plays the 0, then Angel would stop and won the game, indicated with a little diamond down there. In other words, Demon probably shouldn't be playing the 0 because he thinks that Angel might then want to stop and win the game. He can't count on her being so silly to repeat the game at that moment, so he will want to play the 1 instead. Now in the state 1, Angel would have lost the game, but of course Angel is stupid. If she were to stop, Demon would want by indicated to the box, but she will then decide to repeat. Same choice happens again. We're in a situation where Demon is being asked whether he wants to play 0 or 1. If he were to play 0, well, she would stop and lose, but he's not that silly, so he will want to play the 1. But then Angel, of course, has no incentive of stopping. Instead, she'll want to repeat. In fact, we're actually at the same state yet again, where she could decide to stop and lose or repeat. And then Demon plays one and repeat, and Demon plays one and repeat, and Demon plays one and repeat, and Demon plays one. You kind of get it. I could do this until the end of time. That means this is essentially a filibuster situation. Each of the players could let the other win. When they give in and 
demon could say, oh, I'm fed out with this, I'm going to play zero, and then you can, Angel can stop and she will win, but why would you do that in a game? Likewise, Angel could give in and at any moment say, okay, I get it, I stop, um, and, and you'll have won the game. But why would you, would you do that? And that means this logical formula wouldn't have a true value, whether there is such a winning strategy for Angel or not, unless we remind ourselves about the fact that it is still a well-founded repetition that Angel is playing. That means she gets to call whether she wants to stop or repeat, but she cannot repeat forever. She has to ultimately actually stop. Similar situations happen in these cases, for example, where if you are repeating a game where you first reset the value to zero and then follow a differential equation in a dual style where the demon is in charge of following this, then, well, the demon could decide to follow for zero time units, which keeps the value zero, and Angel will have won the game. So he won't want to do that, right? He will want to follow for a positive duration, then Angel could stop and lose or repeat and reset it to zero. So and again, this is a continuous version of that where both of the players can let the other win. And the only reason why Angel does not have a winning strategy and the formula does have a well-defined true value is because she cannot repeat forever. This is another example where Angel gets to repeat, Demon gets to follow a differential equation, x prime equals 1, for his arbitrary duration, and then the value of x is set to 0, at which point Angel really wants to stop and win. But it would also be very bad if Demon were allowed to follow this differential equation literally forever, like for infinite time units, because then even if Angel would ultimately win the game, he would sort of delay the inevitable loss of his forever. So also, just like in repetitions, it's important to ultimately stop in differential equations. It's also important to ultimately stop. So only because the actual duration is a real number and not infinity is this formula actually one that true in every state. Well-defined games cannot be postponed forever, and also it wouldn't be fun if you postponed games forever. Let's summarize. What we've seen is the hybrid games programming language. We had, again, discrete assignments for atomic change that takes no time. Test or challenge games, where we're testing a logical formula Q to check whether it's true. Differential equations within evolution domain constraints, where we evolve for an arbitrary real number duration that Angel gets to decide making sure Q is always true. Games of choice, where Angel is being asked whether she wants to play the alpha sub game or instead play the beta sub game. A sequential game, where we first play the alpha sub game, and whenever we're done with that, without a player having lost prematurely, we play the beta sub game. The repetition game, where Angel is in charge of controlling the repetition, and every time alpha just stopped, uh, without prematurely having a player lost, um, she will be asked whether she wants to stop the loop or repeat it once more. And, most excitingly, the duel game. Now, the duel, which flips the roles of the two players around, such that every choice that Angel had, now Demon does, and every choice that Demon did uh, have is now Angel's choice. And likewise, the responsibilities of premature losses are flipped around. Differential game logic formulas are built in the same way around the hybrid games language, just like differential dynamic logic formulas are built around the hybrid systems language. Duality is the most important syntactic change, in fact, the only one. Differential game logic formulas have real arithmetic, quantifiers of all or one real number. And the new parts are the modalities which we now read differently, where for hybrid game alpha, recursively built out of this form, and a differential game logic formula P recursively built out of this form. Alpha diamond P expresses that Angel does have a winning strategy in the hybrid game alpha to make it to a state where P is satisfied, whereas alpha box P expresses that Demon has a winning strategy in the hybrid game alpha to make it to a state where P holds true. So summarizing what we've seen 
is the advent of differential game logic, which we can either understand as a combination of game logic with hybrid games, or as a combination of differential learning logic with the duality operators. And the latter one is more natural for us. Differential game logic is the logic for hybrid games. It gives us a compositional programming language and a compositional logic. It combines discrete, continuous, and adversarial dynamics freely. But the catch was that so far we've really only seen a very informal operational semantics of the game. The operational semantics was good for our intuition because we see directly from the game trees what happens when and who gets to decide and so on. Uh, but oh boy, that wasn't very mathematical yet. Granted, there is a way of making this mathematical, but you go down the rabbit hole of descriptive set theory, which is super exciting, but I invite you to read up about it in the journal article in the Transactions and Computational Logic of 2015, if you're interested in that. What we will be de developing in the next chapter is a formal semantics of it, and one that will turn out to be still exciting, but a lot